is such a fucking asshole. It's a little strong, I think. No, no, it's not. She's killing herself to take care of his kids, his house, him, mm -hmm. and he's fucking lying and sneaking out to play. I I'm sorry, what was that? What was he playing it's, with it's, his little friends? Okay, that was so selfish. It's so unbelievably selfish. It is so, it's so selfish. I totally agree with that, but I don't know if he's a fucking ass. I mean, he's an idiot, but I think it's understandable. I even think it's kind of funny. Yeah, what's funny about it? In 2007, Seth Rogen and Katherine Heigl starred in one of the highest grossing movies of 2007, Knocked Up. The film had catapulted the careers of not just Heigl, but also Seth Rogen, Jonah Hill, and some other people, you know. The movie was written and directed by Judd Apatow and was produced by Apatow and Seth Rogen and some other people, who cares? According to Wikipedia, it, quote, follows the repercussions of a drunken one-night stand between a slacker and a recently promoted media personality that results in an unintended pregnancy. Now, if you were born yesterday and know absolutely nothing about this movie, this would sound like a fun feminist romp about a woman going to get a shmushmortion, as they call it in the movie. With shmushmortion. That sounds like a fun movie, right? It has the energy of unpregnant, taking a controversial issue about human rights and filtering it through a fun romp. And I'm no screenwriter, but that honestly sounds so much more fun than what we actually get. This movie was painful to watch. I had only seen bits and pieces of this movie before deciding to make a video about it, and I did not realize how much I can't stand Judd Apatow's comedy style until watching this movie in full. Comedy is obviously subjective, and there's obviously a certain portion of the population that his style of comedy really appeals to. Um, I will never understand why, especially after watching this movie, but if you like this movie, you probably aren't going to like this video because I'm not going to be super nice to it. Although I do hope you stick around because I'm not here to necessarily attack the critics and viewers who praise this movie, but to attack the movie itself. Last time I did a retrospective on a classic movie was Soul Food, and I admitted that even though it has some extremely misogynistic undertones, I still enjoyed the movie for what it was and thought it was really funny in some parts. I can't say the same for Knocked Up, but this is not simply going to be a dunk fest. I'm stealing this from one of my favorite writers, Aubrey Gordon, but this is going to be a nutritious dunking, as always. Because Knocked Up received an overwhelming amount of positive reviews and critical acclaim when it premiered. Critics called it funny, rude, and with a heart of gold. They praised the supposed chemistry between Heigl and Rogan and praised the cast and Apatow's ability to stretch up seemingly razor-thin premise into a well-developed, okay, maybe too developed, final product. Even some critics today still praise the film, calling it a time capsule of comedy filmmaking from over a decade ago. Journalist and film critic Steven Silver said in 2022, quote, a decade and a half after its release, Judd Apatow's 2007 comedy Knocked Up is mostly known for a few controversies. All of those controversies have some merit, but that doesn't mean the film itself deserves to be written off, unquote. Nowadays, the movie is mostly known for Katherine Heigl's criticisms of Knocked Up, the movie that made her a household name. She accused the movie of being a little sexist, which then caused a rift between her, Seth Rogen, and Judd Apatow. This was sort of the beginning of the end for Katherine. This was one of many instances that got her labeled as difficult. If you know anything about Hollywood, then you know that a woman being labeled as difficult is akin to having a scarlet A branded on their clothes. But was Catherine right? She got so much heat for her, let's be honest, correct criticism, and was accused of being ungrateful because how dare an actor criticize their own movie? So let's see if they're right. How is Knocked Up sexist? And does Knocked Up deserve to be written off? Or does it have some secretly progressive underlying message about gender dynamics, family, and pregnancy? Or was it just a moment? A moment in history where everyone for some reason obsessed over a sensational movie that actually was never that good. That's what we're going to talk about today. So get in, loser. We're about to go get knocked up by Seth Rogen. Ooh, baby, I like it. Now the first crime that this movie commits is that it is two hours and nine minutes long. For what reason? For what reason does it need to be two hours and nine minutes long? This is a comedy, not a Marvel movie. I'm stealing this point from one of my favorite podcasts, the Bechdel cast, but it should be illegal for a comedy to be two hours, just saying. 
The movie starts off with Ben Stone, played by Seth Rogen and his buddies slash roommates, being silly, doing drugs, riding roller coasters. We've got Jason, played by Jason Siegel, Jonah, played by Jonah Hill, Jay, played by Jay Baruchel, and Martin, played by Martin Starr, because Judd Apatow couldn't come up with any character names for them. There's an entire subplot where the guys dare their roommate Martin to resist shaving his beard for a year and they will pay his half of the rent, but if he shaves, he'll have to pay all of their rents. Now Jason neglected to mention that during this dare, he will have to endure relentless insults made at his expense. Now does this deep plot have any bearing on the plot in any way whatsoever? No. There's also another pointless C plot, I guess I'll call it, where the guys are trying to develop a website dedicated to informing people on where to find the exact timestamps where actresses get naked in movies. <laughs> so, only at fleshofthestars.com will customers be able to find exactly how long into what movies their favorite stars are exposed. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Judd Apatow apparently thought this was the funniest thing in the world, even though in retrospect, it's pretty laughable. Also, Flesh of the Stars, they couldn't have come up with something more creative than that, like Netflix or Cockbuster or I don't know, anything but that. I've also seen this plot in other comedy films of this era, so I'm not sure why Judd and Seth thought this was just the cleverest thing in the world. Now, what about plots A and B? Well, the B plot centers around Debbie, played by Leslie Mann, her husband Pete, played by Paul Rudd, and their two daughters, Charlotte and Zadie, played by Leslie Mann and Judd Apatow's real-life daughters. And I will admit, they got a few laughs from me. <laughs> Quiet! <laughs> You're starting to annoy me! Well, I think a stork, he, um, he drops it down, and, it, and then a hole goes in your body. Right from the beginning, it becomes apparent that there are some p -p -p problems in Debbie and Pete's marriage. I have an appointment with a trainer. I can't cancel now. He'll charge me. You didn't tell me that. Yeah, I did. Last week, I told you. You didn't tell me. Oh, I did. And then I wrote it on the calendar like you told me to. No, you didn't tell me. Debbie is a total incomplete Karen, like the worst Karen imaginable. And Pete is a happy, lovable dope who loves to sneak away from his family from time to time, which later evolves into another plot where Debbie suspects he is cheating on her. Now, the A plot centers around Ben and Allison, played by Captain Heigl. Allison is a reporter for the Real Life E Network and gets promoted to be an on-camera reporter. She is told to tighten up, aka lose weight. Hey, you want me to lose weight? <laughs> I don't want you to lose weight. No, uh, we can't legally ask you to do that. We didn't say lose no. weight. I might say tighten. Tight. A little tighter. Admittedly a funny scene that we will unpack later. Allison and Debbie go out to the club to celebrate her promotion where Allison meets Ben at the bar. Jason encourages Ben to go and talk to Allison and Jason tries hitting on Debbie, but Allison completely cockblocks her. Just try not to stare. She's married. Why do you have to say that? What? It's a shame. You're beautiful. Thank you. And she has two kids too. Shut up! I had a hard time paying attention to this scene because Smile by Lily Allen is playing in the background and I love that song and I'm low-key pissed that this movie thinks it deserves Lily Allen. There's also a funny moment where Debbie pulls out her phone and Ben and Allison are like, Hello? Cool phone. Yeah, it's a really cool phone. After Debbie leaves, Allison decides to stay and hang out with Ben. They have a drink too many and end up hooking up at her place. See, in that Wikipedia page and in almost every one summary of this movie, they keep saying that they hooked up one night and then she got preggers. But what a lot of people fail to emphasize is that during the scene in which they conceive, Ben straight up stealths Allison. If you don't know what stealthing is, it is the practice of removing one's condom during sex without the knowledge and consent of one's partner, frequently regarded as sexual assault or rape and punishable by law. What happens is this. Ben fumbles with the condom, Allison tells him to hurry up, and he takes that to mean, forget the condom altogether. She is obviously unaware of what he has just done. Even if she hadn't gotten pregnant as a result of this, this is still assault. The movie does not portray it that way, but that is an important thing to keep in mind when we talk about this movie. The movie passes this off as just a dumb goof, but it's not a goof and it's not fucking funny. Call me a sensitive snowflake or a feminist killjoy, I really don't fucking care, because I do not think it's a good thing if people find it funny to stuff someone and potentially fuck up their life, which is what literally happens in this movie. 
The next morning, they wake up together and decide to go out for coffee. They bump into Pete, who gushes over them fucking or whatever, and then... Never do what they did. I need to do it. You are? Uh-oh. Someone's getting homeschooled. Cute. Ben tells Allison that weed is a perfect cure for a hangover, but Allison doesn't smoke weed. Really? You don't? No. At all? Mm-mm. Like in the morning? No, I just don't. He tells her about the nudie website that he's trying to start with his friends, and Allison is, of course, disgusted by this because she's a woman and feels a little put off by Ben for obvious reasons. He doesn't have a job, he doesn't have a phone, and he doesn't appear to have any goals or aspirations. So Allison gives him her business card, and they part ways. Eight weeks later, during an interview with James Franco, Allison becomes nauseous and throws up on camera. Her coworker Barry makes fun of her. See you again. It's gonna make me throw up. You look like Job of the Hut dying. She throws up again, and he jokes that she might be pregnant. Dude, that's what I said. She's probably pregnant, right? Oh, shit. How does she look right now? She looks like she just realized that she's pregnant. She goes to her sister and tells her that she may have missed her period, but isn't sure because she also doesn't track her periods for some reason. We get a montage of Debbie and Allison sprinting to the store to buy a bunch of pregnancy tests because buying one wouldn't be enough, I guess. And they both take them because why not, I guess. You bought a bunch of them, so might as well get your piss in all of them, right? All of them come out positive and Debbie tells Allison that she should call Ben and tell him. Allison says she can't call him because he doesn't have a phone, and Debbie says... He doesn't have a phone? Said he had some kind of billing issue. He can't afford a phone? Sadie has a phone. Yeah, because she's your daughter and you bought her a phone. What? Allison remembers that he gave her his email address, and so she decides to email him her number. He calls her and asks her if they can meet up for dinner. He, of course, thinks she's calling because... She's locking away in dick taste. But oh boy, is he in for a surprise, you guys. All at dinner, he tells her about how he is an illegal Canadian immigrant who was hit by a postal truck when he was in high school and received $14,000 and has lived off that for 10 years. I mean, until now. I mean, it's been almost 10 years. I have like 900 bucks left. So that should last me for like, I mean, I'm not a mathematician, but like another two years or some shit, I think. Yeah. LOL that he thinks $900 could last you two years. Nowadays, if you're poor, that lasts you like two minutes four at best the entire time allison just looks at him like he's absolutely insane this is her default facial expression towards him throughout this movie just perpetual confusion also my facial expression while watching this movie she finally gives him the big news i'm pregnant fuck off what what i'm pregnant with emotion with a baby you're the father she says she doesn't understand how it happened, and he admits to not putting on a condom. I did not tell you not to wear a condom. I didn't mean do it without a condom. I meant do it, like hurry up, like get fucking going. Yes, Allison, we all knew what you meant when you said hurry up. But for some reason, this movie wants us to think that Ben is such a dumbass that he doesn't understand how words and actions work. He also straight up blames her for not noticing that he wasn't wearing a condom. They go to the doctor together to confirm the pregnancy and her doctor gives her an ultrasound and tells her that she is indeed expecting. This causes Allison to break down in tears. <laughs> ben tells his friends and they scold him for not wearing a condom and then this scene happens. Tell me you don't want him to get an A word. Yes, I do and I won't say it for little baby ears over there, but it rhymes with shmushmorshin. You should get a shmushmorshman at the shmushmorshman clinic. I love how these pot-smoking, sex-obsessed bros can sit around getting high all day, geeking out over nudity and R-rated films, but can't even utter the A-word. Allison talks to her mom, who tells her that she should just get a shishmorshin and that pregnancy will make her super fat. Three months. No. Three months. Fat in the face. Jowls. Fat ass. Put a pin in that. She tells her that Debbie got an A-word once and now has a, quote, real baby. She literally says that. She had the same situation as you, and she had it taken care of. And you know what? Now she has a real baby. Allison decides to keep the baby despite the fact that no one else thinks it's a good idea because it's not a good idea, obviously. Ben's dad, however, thinks it's a good idea and just sort of treats the situation like it's no biggie. Life doesn't care about your vision, okay? Stuff happens, you just gotta deal with it. You just have to deal with it. <laughs> Put a pin in that. Ben and Allison decide to give their relationship a chance after she tells them that she's going to keep the baby. 
They both laugh about how they have no fucking clue what they're supposed to do and are not prepared for a child. But you know, it's funny. It's funny birthing children into a bunch of mess. Ben has breakfast with the fam and meets Pete, Charlotte, and Sadie. Debbie dislikes Ben because he's overweight and has bad genes and their kid is going to be overweight. Debbie just straight up fat shames the shit out of Ben and Allison says nothing about it. She just makes that same stupid face that she keeps making for some reason and is like, Just give him a break. We get a montage of them spending time together, going to the doctor, watching movies and searching for nudity in them and Ben spending time with her nieces. During a meeting with her doctor, she tells him she wants to have a close relationship with him and wants to make sure he will be there when she goes into labor. He says that she has nothing to fear because he doesn't even take vacations. And wow, I wonder what's going to happen on the big day. Guess you'll have to wait and see. We get an uncomfortable scene between Pete and Debbie where Debbie just yells at Pete and calls him stupid for not caring about the sex offenders who live in their neighborhood. You're so concerned with stuff. Like, don't get them vaccinated. Don't let them eat fish. There's mercury in the water. Jesus, how much Dateline NBC can you watch? What are you doing? Because I want to rip your fucking head off because you're so fucking stupid. This is scary. And Ben just stands there and watches the entire thing. I almost skipped the scene because it was so weird and made me feel really uneasy. Ben and Allison run into Allison's friends, whom we never see outside of this scene. Ben tells them she's pregnant and then says... It's actually, it's a really funny story, actually. If you guys, if you got a second to hear not it. Not really funny. It's not funny. You're right, Allison. It's not funny. Huh? Don't drink and bone. Wow. Okay. Ben thinks Allison is embarrassed by him and is resenting him for not proposing, so he decides to propose to her with an empty box. She turns him down. Um, I don't know. We've only known each other 17 weeks, so it's... Okay. The guys found out their innovative idea for a website has already been innovated by someone else. During an excruciating sex scene, Ben fears that he will poke the baby, but Allison insists that it's fine and just starts yelling at him constantly. She tries to get on top, but feels insecure about her body. He says he wants to do it doggy style, and she says, Oh, I do not want you to fuck me like a dog. What? After failing to have sex, she tells him that she won't ever make him do it again. Moving on though, Debbie snoops into Pete's emails and search history to find out where he's been sneaking off to. After having dinner together, Ben, Allison, and Debbie follow him and find out that he's been secretly meeting with a bunch of guys to participate in a fantasy baseball draft. He confesses to also going to the movies by himself and this upsets Debbie. I went to the movies. With who? By myself. What'd you see? Spider-Man 3. I like Spider-Man. He says he does it so that he can get away from the family and have time for himself, and she says that she would also like time for herself. Debbie then tells him that she doesn't want him at the house anymore, and they separate. Allison tells Ben that she just can't believe Pete, but Ben thinks the situation is funny because, of course he does. A heated argument ensues when Ben says he relates to Pete, and Allison rolls her eyes and complains about how she's had to sacrifice her body, her vagina, and her youth. He says he'll pay for vaginal reconstructive surgery, and she says, You can't pay for shit! You can barely buy spaghetti! You're right. She kicks him out of the car in the middle of traffic. He later meets her at the doctor's office, where they once again get into a heated argument. She tells him she's hormonal and that she wishes he would stop treating everything as a joke. She says he lacks commitment, but how does he lack commitment if he proposed to her? It almost seems as though you forgot I proposed to you like an asshole and you said no to me. See, all you have to do is get on one knee with an empty box in hand and that's all you have to do to prove your commitment to someone. Later, Pete and Ben run off to Vegas where they complain about the women in their lives. Pete compares marriage to Everybody Loves Raymond. Marriage is like that show Everybody Loves Raymond, but it's not funny. Dialogue, everybody's just really pissed off and tense. I'm 25. I have no idea what that means. Debbie tells Allison that they're going to start a new life and be positive, which means cutting in line at the club and thinking they can get in based on their looks. And then one of the worst scenes I've ever seen in a movie happens. We are capacity, okay? We'll let some people in when it clears out a little. You get right in if you go back to the end of the line. It is what it is, sweetie. Now, can you step to the back, please? You don't need to call me sweetie. Yeah, maybe you should listen no, to your No, you don't friend. need to call me sweetie. I'm not going to go to the end of the fucking line. Who the fuck are you? I have just 
as much of a right to be here as any of these little skanky girls. What, am I not skanky enough for you? You may have power now, but you're not God. You're a doorman, okay? You're a doorman, 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 doorman! He then pulls her to the side and tells her that she's right for acting like a Karen because he hates his job and then tells her that his boss told him to only let in 5% black people and then shames her for bringing her pregnant sister to the club. Mm -hmm. Debbie cries about her age and how... Men. I get worse looking and he gets better looking and it's so fucking unfair. Oh God, just kill me. Pete and Ben get high off shrooms and Pete wallows about love and how he can't accept Debbie's love or something. Get her at her niece's birthday party. Allison breaks things off with Ben. I just don't think we can make it work. We can get back on track and everything's gonna be great. You just be nice. And I'm being nice. And just because we're two nice people doesn't mean we should stay together. We get an entire section dedicated to Allison interviewing real celebs like Steve Carell and Jessica Alba who all comment on her belly. When, when is that baby popping out? I got two months to go. Really? Are you dilated? Wow, yeah, wow. I can tell. <laughs> You're about to drop any second. You know, I love your brooch. You don't need to lie to me. I don't appreciate it. I know I look like a fat cow. And it's after this, after her belly has become pretty fucking visible that her boss finds out that she's pregnant. What's under that jacket? You're pregnant, have been for a while. From my count, you're right around eight months. It doesn't make any sense. But anyway, they tell her that this is good actually because viewers love pregnancy and she can interview all the pregnant celebrities, so yay. All right, let's wrap this up, shall we? Allison goes into labor but can't get in contact with her doctor. So she gets naked and takes a bubble bath. She calls Ben and he rushes over to help her. They essentially kiss and make up. He learns that her doctor took a vacation even though he promised her earlier that he wouldn't. Are you happy about that payoff? Cause I'm not. He rushes her to the hospital. Their doctor is a rude asshole. Can I leave? Do you want to be the doctor? Because I really don't need to be here. No. You mean you want to take a second to tell me how to do my job? My job. Once again, Allison is portrayed as a controlling bitch because she didn't want to take an epidural. Like, she wasn't telling you how to do your job. She just didn't want to take an epidural. Like, I love how Allison is being portrayed as a bitch here when the doctor can't even handle the woman going into labor and making a simple request to not take drugs. I don't know why this doctor triggered me so much, but honestly, it's probably because I've dealt with so many male doctors who can be really sexist, don't like to listen to you, or get really defensive when you're just a little assertive. Anyway. Ben's friends slash roommates come to the hospital, but Jonah doesn't like hospitals because... I'm not having shit besides a fucking panic attack. There's probably a fucking room back there full of dead bodies. Well, of course they do. It's a hospital. Allison apologized to Ben for breaking up with him for some reason and then says... I was just in such a panic from all of this. And, uh, watching Debbie and Pete together. And my ass got so fat. No, no. It did. I just never for one minute thought that the guy who got me pregnant would actually be the right guy for me. Put a pin in it. Debbie and Pete show up and Debbie tries kicking Ben out of the room, but Ben... Look, Debbie, you are high off your ass if you think you're coming into that room. That room. That's my room now. That little area with the Pepsi machine, that's your area. And this apparently causes Debbie to finally respect Ben. We get a gnarly shot of the baby coming out of Allison's cleanly shaved vagina. Listen, I watched my sister give birth to my 10 year old nephew and it does not look as clean and perfect as they show it in this movie. The shot is supposed to be shocking of course, but to me it was just funny. Anyway, she pushes out the baby, Pete records with his camera, everyone hugs and kisses each other and then we cut to Ben, Allison, the baby, driving off to their new place that Ben has bought for them. Footage of Allison and Ben being a family place during the credits, convincing us that everything turned out all right. We'll never have problems again. It's only smooth, smooth sailing from now on. Uh -uh. The end. <laughs> Quiet. You're starting to annoy me. While looking up critiques of this film from film critics, one thing I noticed is that there are three different kinds of people. People who love Knocked Up, people who hate it, and people who recognize the flaws but still think the movie is full of laughs. Many people have the same critiques. It's conservative, the women are uptight shrews, Ben is a schlub, Debbie is a nag, blah 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 blah. 
Many female critics complained about the stark differences in the ways men and women are portrayed in the movie. And I don't really like to call people dumb, but you would have to be an idiot to not notice how incredibly sexist this movie is. It's not even subtle. It's so not subtle that the lead actress complained about the sexism not even a year after the movie was released, saying it was, quote, a little sexist. It paints the women as shrews, as humorless and uptight, and it paints the men as lovable, goofy, fun-loving guys. It exaggerated the characters, and I had a hard time with it on some days. I'm playing such a bitch. Why is she being such a killjoy? Why is this how you're portraying women? 98% of the time, it was an amazing experience, but it was hard for me to love the movie. Unquote. Now, Judd Apatow, Seth Rogen, and the rest of the media portrayed this as just absolute unforgivable slander, and her career was profoundly hurt by this. Seth Rogen said that he felt betrayed by Catherine since they had such a good time working together during filming. People seemed to like it, he said. We were funny together. I was having a really good time, and then when I heard afterward that she didn't like it, that she seemed to not like the process, and she did not like the end product either, I think when that happens, also your trust feels somewhat betrayed. Now, I guess I can somewhat understand that on some level. You work so closely and so well with someone, and then when that someone has some not-so-positive thoughts on the thing you worked on, it can sting a little. So even though I absolutely agree with Catherine, I can understand why he felt hurt by her criticism. I have a little less sympathy for Judd Apatow, though. During an interview with Howard Stern, Vomit, he apparently felt that Catherine owed him an apology. You think that at some point I'll get a call saying, sorry, I was tired, and then the call never comes, he said, unquote. In 2009, he appeared on the Opie and Anthony show, never heard of it, and said... Well, she, on the cover of Vanity Fair, it said that she thought that the movie was a little sexist, and she thought we made guys look goofy and lovable, and the women were portrayed as shrews. And you know, it's hard to judge what that's all about, <laughs> because when you do a cover story... They probably meet with you several times and talk for like five, six hours, and mm. you can get tired and, and, and slip and just go a little farther than, than you mean. Or she completely means it. <laughs> uh, I like how he says maybe she was tired. Like the only way someone could think it was sexist is if they're tired and don't really know what they're saying. Her comment didn't read as someone who's tired and is just saying shit. He clearly was butthurt by her comments and couldn't even try to understand where she was coming from. They both kept emphasizing how much they enjoyed working with her and how great she was as if her comments negate that. Catherine said 98% of the time she had a good time working with Judd and Seth, but that the portrayal of her character rubbed her the wrong way. Is she not allowed to say that? The fact that her career was tainted by this one very reasonable critique is kind of ridiculous. And Seth Rogen seems to somewhat agree. I respect the fact that perhaps she realizes that this has hurt her career. And I don't want that to have happened to her at all because I've said a thousand stupid things and I really like her, said Rogan. The only people who in this situation should in any way take anything from it is me and Judd because we're the ones she was talking about. For other people to not work with her because she didn't like her experience with us is, I think it's crazy. And I think it's crazy too. Now, of course, her comment came on the heels of some controversy surrounding her and Shonda Rhimes and Grey's Anatomy, which she starred in at the time. I'm not going to get into that right now because I honestly don't know what to think of it. I mean, I genuinely don't understand why actors aren't allowed to express unhappiness with the projects that they've worked on. I understand celebrities are rich and extremely privileged, but I don't see why someone's career has to be upended because they insulted the director or felt the project they were working on had some misogynistic undertones. Just because Judd or Shonda Rhimes gave her a job doesn't mean she's not allowed to speak her mind. But maybe there's something else going on with Catherine that I'm missing. I'd be happy to know. But I'm tired, so let's talk about the sexism in question. To me, the most sexist portrayal doesn't solely come from Allison, it comes from Debbie. As I mentioned earlier, Debbie is a full-on Karen. Now, I know everyone loves to just hurl the word Karen at any woman who's assertive or any woman they don't like for that matter, but Debbie is like the ideal Karen. Like, if you wanted to show someone what a Karen was, just show them this movie. She's constantly yelling at her husband, is extremely judgmental, ignorant, and fucking rude as hell for no reason. The fact that that scene takes place between her and a black man feels very tone deaf, especially when he talks about how his boss told him to only let in 5% black people. You think this is going to be a moment for her to finally see herself and stop being so entitled and rude, but it's just a moment for her to realize that she's old? I guess women in their 30s can't go to clubs anymore. This is another area where the conservativeness comes out. 
There's nothing wrong with going to the club in your 30s. Conservative people think that once you have kids or reach a certain age, you're not allowed to go out and have fun anymore. And a lot of people internalize that, and I think it ultimately causes parents to be resentful towards their children. It's okay for moms and dads to have their own lives and to have fun. I would say the same for Pete. See, another reason why I know Catherine was right in her criticism is because this movie caused me, a militant feminist, to absolutely hate the women in this movie and feel bad for the men. And I felt really bad for Pete. I don't blame him for sneaking away from her. Wouldn't you sneak away if she screamed at you that way? Judd defends this in that same interview from earlier. One thing I never see in movies, which is women scream at you. Yes. Women motherfuck you. And when you fight, it's ugly. And I, and I thought, C Catherine Keener was so funny yelling in 40-Year-Old Virgin. I just wanted to show a different kind of relationship conflict and let it just go to 10 and have them, like, motherfuck each other. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think Judd is necessarily a misogynistic piece of shit. I don't even think he's a bad person. But this is why people need to learn to take thoughtful criticism against their own work. Because I think if he did, he could have learned something. I don't think he realizes or understands that this idea he has of women is inherently sexist. Women don't just scream at you. Like, what are you talking about? Yes, there are people who can be emotionally abusive, which is what Debbie is, and we should call it that. But that is not something that is intrinsic to women. He makes it seem like this is just a normal part of relationships. For some people it is, but again, he's making it seem like all women are like this and all men are just calm, cool, and collected, suffering at the hands of their screaming wives. This is why the controversy around Catherine is frustrating. If you sympathize with women so much, then why can't you try and understand what Catherine, a woman, is saying about it? He doesn't have to blindly agree with her, but he could have at least tried to understand where she was coming from. And then him acting like she owes him an apology is just like, really, dude? Maybe you're not misogynistic, but you're having a very misogynistic response to a woman criticizing your stupid movie that you think is so clever. There's nothing clever about the way Debbie is written. Debbie's struggle to cope with getting older causes her to become extremely bitter. That's not clever at all. It's an incredibly sexist cliche. It plays on old sexist stereotypes of women becoming bitter and miserable as they age and taking out on everyone around them. When she goes to the club with Allison and sees the bouncer letting in two conventionally attractive 20-somethings, she gets angry. So angry that she has a full-blown Karen meltdown and starts berating this man in front of everyone and completely humiliating him. This is apparently how Judd Apatow thinks women over a certain age act, and that this is not only normal, but fine. He has this uninterrogated perception of women and is unable to see how toxic this behavior is. Playing it for laughs is one thing, but the movie justifies Debbie's actions. She's never reprimanded for any of this. Ben rightfully says she's a pain in the ass a few times, but no one ever says it to her face. It's Pete who needs to stop being selfish. It's Pete who needs to spend more time with his wife and accept her love. Like, we're not going to talk about Debbie consistently calling her husband fucking stupid and yelling at him constantly and just being fucking mean for no reason. Nope, nope, nope. It's Pete that needs to change. Like, what the actual fuck, Judd? Lest we forget, this is Judd's real life wife. Is this what you think of your wife, Judd? Actually, let me not speculate about this man's relationship that's inappropriate, but like, it's weird, right? I don't see how someone could watch this movie and sympathize with Debbie. She's fucking awful. <laughs> What's worse is there's no real resolution to her arc. Pete decides to move back home and spend more time with his wife and kids, and then that's it. Dorothy Woodend had this to say about the film in 2007. Quote, It's okay for men to take psychedelic mushrooms and run off to Las Vegas. But women who are older than 22 should stay the hell out of nightclubs. The male characters, for all their scatological blue language, are still an inherently conservative group. The fuck talk, bong hits, and porn bits are used to give the film a light coating of rebellion. But the morality is strictly old school. It's women's jobs to make men grow up. And it is men's job to buy women $1,400 cribs to put babies into. Unquote. This is essentially how Judd decides to end Debbie's arc. Although the betrayal of Debbie is clearly sexist, she is positioned as being in the right. Pete deserves to be yelled at by his wife until he finally grows up. Pete and all the other men who are immature need to be trained by the women in their lives. You need to train him. Huh? You criticize them a lot, and then they get so down on themselves that they're forced to change. And then in the end, 
They thank you for it. Because by this movie's logic, men are dogs and are incapable of maturing on their own. Fucking you like a dog. It's doggy style. It's, 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 it's just the style. It's not, it's not like a dog. So on to Allison. Allison sucks mainly because she is criminally underwritten. She's essentially just a plot device. She exists to move the plot forward, but she doesn't have any goals or wants or dreams or personality. Nothing she does makes sense. Her actions are never really explained and it's very frustrating. So let's go through every single baffling decision that Allison makes in this movie, shall we? First off, why does Allison live with her sister? She works at E! and according to a quick search on Google, people at E! make some good money. When she gets promoted, Pete asks if she's going to move out and she just laughs it off. Got a promotion! Oh, congratulations! Thank you. Hey, maybe you can get your own place now. Oh, <laughs> it's not gonna like, happen. What? I don't understand. Why doesn't she want to get her own place? This is never explained at all. If her reasoning for staying with her sister was because she just liked living with her or maybe was afraid of being on her own, I would have been fine with that. Next, Allison gets pregnant and decides to keep the baby. Why? Now listen, I am pro-choice, obviously. So I don't believe in necessarily telling an adult woman or anyone with a uterus whether or not they should have a baby. That is their choice and unless they ask you for your advice, mind your fucking business. However, it just doesn't make sense in this story. Not simply because the pregnancy was a result of a drunken one night stand, but because we don't know why she keeps the baby. We don't get a scene of her contemplating an abortion. We don't get a scene of her coming to the decision that she wants to keep the baby. She just finds out she's pregnant and then just calls Ben and is like, uh, I'm keeping it. Don't know why, but I am. And it just doesn't feel right. Why did she decide to keep it? And what compelled her to try and make things work with Ben? See, many people's criticisms of the movie center around their utter disbelief in this pairing. I will get into that later, but I think what's more confusing is why she decides to both keep the baby and be with Ben. She had a one night stand with him, she barely knows him, and what she's seen from him so far hasn't exactly impressed her. So why does she want to start a family with someone she knows won't be able to support her and the baby? And I don't just mean financially, because she's doing fine on that front, but emotionally and physically. Then there's the fact that she neglects to inform her boss that she's pregnant. Even though she outright tells Ben, Debbie, and Pete that they can't legally fire her for being pregnant and can also get three months maternity leave. But then when her boss finds out, she says that... I just, um, I wasn't expecting this and, and I, didn't, I didn't know how to handle it. I didn't want to lose my job. I'm really sorry. What? You just said they couldn't fire you. What the fuck are you talking about? Now, if her reasoning was because she wanted to keep working and was afraid that they would put her on maternity leave, that would be something, but we don't even get that. When she calls Ben after going into labor, she apologizes to Ben for dumping him and then says, I just never for one minute thought that the guy who got me pregnant would actually be the right guy for me. How? How was he the right guy for you? What has he done to show you that he is the right guy? Nothing. Exactly, Ben. Nothing. We do not learn why she comes to this conclusion. Other than the fact that he was there for her, I suppose, during labor, I don't get why she takes him back. I don't get her, okay? Like, I was so annoyed at how underwritten she is. I watched this movie twice, and it just always felt like she was just there. She just existed. She moves the plot forward, but we never get to know who she is or why she does anything. She doesn't have any friends other than that one scene where she runs into them, but we never see them before or after that scene. The movie spends so much time on the stupid nudie website plotline and the shaving beard dare plotline that it completely neglects to give its main female protagonist any depth. But sure, Catherine is a bitch for calling the movie sexist. Her only personality trait is being serious. She almost never laughs at Ben's jokes because she thinks he's so immature and vulgar. She is offended by colloquial speech, and she spends 80% of the movie just yelling at Ben. There's also a dumb scene where Ben and Pete reference Back to the Future, and Allison doesn't understand the reference, because she's a girl. Where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs> exactly. You want to do that? I don't know who Doc Brown is. What, what are you talking about? Doc Brown is the guy who's Christopher Lloyd. He invented the DeLorean, the time machine. He's the one who made what? the time machine. It's the time machine. Definitely not sexist at all. I've only seen Back to the Future once and not even all the way through, and I knew that reference. Fuck you, Judd Apatow. 
Judd and Seth were so offended by her accusing the movie of being sexist, even though by Judd's own admission, she was right about what she said. He says in that interview that he loves guys being stupid idiots and that women just be screaming at people. If anything, the movie is about what idiots guys are mm -hmm. and how it drives women crazy. And, you know, mm -hmm. the guy who grabs his bong before his pregnant girlfriend when there's an earthquake. You know, we're making fun of the guy, we're not making fun of the girl. So I don't know, I mean, I know where my heart is and I love guys being immature and stupid and, and to see couples not communicate well. Who wants to see people get along? I mean, And that is exactly what Catherine's criticism was. He proved her fucking point. The problem obviously is that he doesn't understand how this is sexist. Allison and Debbie are allergic to fun because they have to be the responsible ones. And honestly, if they'd consulted some moms, they could have done something with that. Moms are often harshly criticized for the ways they parent their children and ways dads are not. We hold motherhood to a higher standard than we do fatherhood. A mom who takes time for herself to get away from her family is going to be looked at differently than a dad who does the same thing. Men who leave their families for months at a time for work are not viewed as selfish. It's seen as a dad doing what a dad has to do to support his family, but if a mom puts her job first, She's abandoned her children and is a terrible mom. We all know the double standards, and frankly, that conversation has already been had and dissected before. Something else I wanted to bring up that I feel is not brought up enough is the class aspects of this movie. The way Allison is written is so interesting and also uninteresting at the same time. She is written from such a privileged, straight white male perspective that Judd doesn't even seem to be aware of it. Allison is an upper-class, thin, conventionally attractive white woman who just got promoted to be an on-camera reporter at her job. She has resources and support systems that most single moms who end up in these situations don't have. She can afford a nanny and daycare and fucking formula. She doesn't really need a man to help her raise a baby. For a lot of white women, especially upper-class white women, having a baby on your own is seen as empowering. It is not viewed that way for poor women of color, however. Can you imagine how people would react if a black woman told everyone she got pregnant by some rando at the club and was keeping the baby? People would call her fast and ratchet and a hood rat. Now, I don't say that to say that the Allisons of the world shouldn't be allowed to have babies on their own. No. What I'm saying is that this makes it even more confusing as to why Judd feels Allison needs to be with Ben in order to have her baby. She doesn't need him. Now, if he wants to be in his child's life, then that is his right. But Allison is fine. And even if her keeping the baby makes no sense, it's still fine because she is extremely privileged. That's why the beginning of this film upsets me so much. Imagine if Allison wasn't so privileged. Imagine if she were just some 20-something black woman working at McDonald's and living in a cheap studio apartment or something. This scenario would be even more of a complete nightmare for her as it is for Ben. Because the difference between Allison and a 20-something black woman working at McDonald's is that Allison will always have access to abortion. A 20-something might not. That's why the movie making an entire joke of the situation disturbs me. Especially now that Roe has been overturned. When Ben tells his dad about what's going on, he just brushes it off like it's no big deal and says that... No, this is not a disaster. It is. An earthquake is a disaster. Your grandmother having Alzheimer's so bad she doesn't even know who the fuck I am. That's a disaster. This is a good thing. This is a blessing. I have a vision for how my life would go. Life doesn't care about your vision, okay? Stuff happens, you just gotta deal with it. You roll with it, that's, that's the beauty of it all. At least his friends somewhat scolded him for purposely not wearing a condom. His dad has nothing to say about that. His dad also goes on about how he didn't plan for Ben either, but that he's the best thing that ever happened to him. The message here is clear. Even if you don't plan for a baby, it will ultimately be the best thing that's ever happened to you. And according to the movie, I guess it is, for Ben. The underlying theme of the movie is that everything happens for a reason, I guess. Allison meets Ben at the bar, has a one night stand with a man who stealths her and then gets pregnant. This is every woman's worst nightmare. Not because Ben is fat, but because their entire life has been flipped turned upside down because of some idiot who didn't understand what hurry up meant. The fact that the men who made this movie think this is somehow a great coming of age story and not an actual fucking nightmare for most people and people with uteruses is telling. I'm not saying there can't be humor in these situations. Humor is complex and sometimes even in fucked up situations, you can always find a way to joke about it. But the movie doesn't do that really because it never takes what Ben did seriously. Rather, it treats the entire situation as a funny goof. 
like whoops we had a few too many and had a baby guess that's just life sometimes and yeah that is life for a lot of people but a lot of those people don't end up being good parents and a lot of those people end up resenting the shit out of their children for taking away their youth there's a whole scene of Allison ranting about how I sacrificed my job my body my youth my vagina even though she chose to keep the fucking baby I can't even imagine what this family will look like in 18 years. I don't have much hope for them. I guess I just don't personally find it funny to birth children into mess. I think children deserve to have a loving support system from emotionally immature people who actually want them. Ben and Allison are not mature. Towards the end of the movie when Allison is having contractions, she gets into the bathtub and Ben asks her what she's doing. She says she wants the baby to be born in a stress-free environment and that if the baby is born into a stressful environment, the baby will be all fucked up. But it's like, girl, you just spent the last nine months in a stressful relationship. A stressful relationship that you didn't have to be in. And to be clear, I know that there are people who had kids they didn't plan for and are great parents. So I don't mean to imply that every person who got pregnant unintentionally is destined to be a bad parent. I also don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with wanting to keep a baby that resulted from a one night stand. It's just sad that most people who end up in those situations don't always have the support or financial stability that someone like Allison has. Allison's decision to keep her baby was easy because she doesn't have to worry about how she's going to feed herself, let alone her baby. She doesn't have to apply for government assistance or worry about who's going to babysit her child while she goes to work to make a living. As much as conservatives love unborn babies, they sure don't give two shits about helping the babies who are in need. The movie doesn't contend with this at all, because at the end of the day, its overall message is that a nice shiny baby can somehow better the lives of two 20-somethings and change their lives for the better. And we should all know by now that that is simply and sadly not always true. <sighs> Alright, let's talk about my crush. Because I don't have a lot of money, you know, I mean, I'm not poor or anything, but I eat a lot of spaghetti. Oh, Ben, where to begin? Um, well, I guess we could start with my favorite topic, anti-fat bias. Yay. Okay, so again, you'd have to be an idiot to not notice how incredibly fat phobic this movie is, because this movie is blatantly fat phobic. You know, he was kind of like medium height, sort of chubby, blonde, curly hair. Remember? With the man boobs. Yes. <laughs> Which is awesome, because I never like guys like you. It's great. I keep saying that. Uh, it's overweight. Where does that end? How old is he? 23. Looks 33. He can barely get in and out of that little house. Imagine how much bigger he's gonna get. You think she's like hiding me? Like she's like embarrassed by me or something like that? Probably. I'd hide you. Something that really frustrated me but didn't surprise me when reading negative or critical reviews of this movie is the utter and complete lack of discussion around the fat shaming that is aimed at Ben. Weight is brought up quite often in the film, but is never really commented on besides jokes and satirical remarks from Allison's boss telling her to tighten. Tight. Throughout the movie, Allison is constantly complaining about how fat she's gotten. Towards the end of the movie, when she apologizes to Ben for dumping him, she says, And my ass got so fat. Oh, no. It did. There's even a small moment between her and the nurse during her doctor's appointment where... Don't worry about gaining weight. Your baby wants you to gain a whole mess of weight. Are you fucking kidding me? This isn't necessarily unrealistic. We live in a fat-phobic and anti-fat society. Fearing fat is instilled in us from a very young age. People who have just had babies are pressured into losing their baby fat as if it's the most important thing after giving birth to a whole ass fucking baby. I have siblings who have had children and the ways people talk about their weight gain to their faces is truly disturbing and honestly cruel. So Allison being upset about her weight gain is understandable, but the movie never really goes anywhere with it. Ben never assures her that even if she has gained weight that she still looks great and he still love her regardless. She'll just say something fat phobic and then he'll just sit there. The movie makes it seem as though all of their issues should be attributed to Allison's unhappiness with her body. Even in that scene where she complains about how I sacrificed my job, my body, my youth, my vagina. She has a point. Women and people with uteruses do have to sacrifice a lot when they decide to have a child. The emotional and physical impacts of pregnancy are often downplayed because it is seen as just a thing that's a part of womanhood, like a menstrual period, which we also downplay the effects of. 
The movie could have delved into that a little further, but it doesn't. But what should I expect when Debbie stands there fat shaming Ben and Allison just stands next to her unbothered by it? Or when the movie constantly brings up how Allison is required to lose weight or tighten up and it's never presented as an obstacle for her. Allison treats it like it's no big deal. She doesn't have any reservations about it or anything. One of the taglines for Knocked Up is, what if this guy got you pregnant? So many critics describe Ben as a schlub or schlubby. Ben's character plays into classic anti-fat tropes of pathetic fat men who always end up with conventionally attractive thin women. I've talked about this before on my Super Size Me video, but I don't think there is some law that states that only certain types of people end up with certain types of people. So I genuinely don't care that much about this odd pairing that everyone was so baffled by. I'm more baffled by the way Ben is written. The way fat men and fat women are portrayed on screen can sometimes overlap, but there are some stark differences. Fat women typically are either super sad and dying to be thin or some obnoxious rude side character that we're supposed to hate or is the fat best friend. Fat men can sometimes have the luxury of their weight being invisible. Like Jack Black in most of his movies or Brian Tyree Henry. They always end up dating conventionally attractive thin women and it's never presented as odd even if viewers find it unbelievable. But another more detrimental way fat men are portrayed is as lazy slackers who are pathetic losers. There's a show on AMC called Kevin Can Fuck Himself and this trope couldn't be more apparent. Not only does Kevin play into this trope, he also plays into the self-absorbed fatty trope as I like to call it as well. See, thin people hate fat people so much that it comes out in the way they write fat people. They often write them to be self-absorbed, greedy pieces of shit who aren't aware of how fat they are. This trope is ever more present in Family Guy with Peter and Lois. Peter is the archetypal self-absorbed fatty. In the Netflix show Love, another show created by Judd Apatow, Mickey's roommate Bertie has a boyfriend named Randy who is fat and he is also presented this way. He's homeless and often mooches off of his girlfriend and his girlfriend is secretly miserable in this relationship. Even in my favorite show, Broad City, this trope is presented with Abby's roommate, Matt Bevers. Alana even makes a comment about how his girlfriend Melody is amazing and that is a shame that she's stuck with him. See, we are always meant to sympathize with their hot wife. We're meant to feel sorry for them that they're stuck with this schlub. We're meant to feel that they deserve better simply because they are hot and their partner is not. What bothers me most about shows like Kevin Can Fuck Himself and Broad City and Love is these characters often exist in shows that are supposed to be progressive. Many of the critiques that pointed out the odd pairing of Katherine Heigl and Seth Rogen came from women, women who might identify as feminists. Feminists and leftists have often dropped the ball when it comes to the discussion of systemic anti-fatness. Many leftists and feminists who probably have criticized beauty standards and the beauty industry don't seem to interrogate this part of themselves. Even feminists now who adopt language from fat activists, especially when talking about diet culture, rarely ever admit to their own participation in excluding fat people from these discussions. I can't imagine how they would respond if, say, the couple was reversed, if Allison was fat and Ben was thin. Would there be people who would criticize the legitimacy of the relationship? Sure. But I doubt feminists or other female critics would be cool with that. We would immediately recognize that as mean and cruel. So why do we do it to fat men? Fat men can be attractive and are deserving of love just like anyone else. It shouldn't be hard for us to believe that people find them attractive and want to hook up with them. Something Aubrey Gordon points out in her book, What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat, is how people just assume that if a thin person is with a fat man, then it must be because the thin person is getting something out of it, as in money or food or housing. Like in Parks and Rec, Ben is so confused by Jerry's marriage that he's constantly contemplating how they ended up together. It's mean, like that's all it is. And it's funny to me that people who would otherwise be pretty smart and thoughtful can't allow their brains to unpack that. If you see a fat man with a thin person and you have this knee-jerk assumption about how they're probably only together because she's a gold digger or something, unpack that. Why do you think that? And why do you think that because you don't find the fat man to be attractive that the person they're with shouldn't either? For the record though, I think Seth Rogen is hot, okay? There, I said it. I think a lot of fat people are hot, just like a lot of thin people are hot. People can be hot regardless of their size and beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I know that's corny to some people, but it's true. And I just wish we could stop talking about fat men or really anybody in this way. This idea that people who aren't conventionally attractive don't deserve the hot person they're with is so strange to me. Just because someone is hot doesn't mean they are more deserving than their not-so-hot partner. 
looks aren't everything. It shouldn't have to be said, but apparently it does. So to answer the question, does Knocked Up deserve to be written off? I would say yes and no. Again, comedy is subjective, so I'm not going to flat out say the movie isn't funny. It did get a couple laughs out of me. But after watching it a couple times, I just don't understand why it was so popular. Seemingly, it was because it was some sort of study on the differences between men and women. A gender essentialist movie about pregnancy and family and who has to sacrifice more and the shit women have to put up with when it comes to men. But it doesn't do so meaningfully because it doesn't even bother to develop Allison as a character. She has no friends while Ben has four. She has no sense of humor while Ben is just all shits and giggles. Debbie is a horrible nag while Pete is goofy and lovable and laid back. During that restaurant scene between the four of them, Debbie and Allison just sit there rolling their eyes as Ben and Pete do impressions and joke about Back to the Future. Women are supposed to watch that and relate to them. We're supposed to empathize with them. If anything, the looks on their faces represent how I felt watching this movie. But not because I agree that Ben, Pete, and every other man in the world are annoying and immature, but, but because it's sad that the movie chose to portray women this way. I've always hated the notion that women are just more mature than men. That's something I've heard my entire life. Men and boys are allowed to get away with a lot of things because the idea is that boys will be boys. We should always expect men to be immature and irresponsible and lazy and stupid. And it's up to women to whip men into shape. It's an unfair expectation to put on women. Because women can be immature and irresponsible too. We don't always know what's right and we make mistakes. And if women do act more mature, it's because the repercussions of our wrongdoings are far greater than the repercussions men face for their wrongdoings. The movie could have said something about that, but it doesn't. Judd was clearly more interested in the bro stoner aspects of the movie than anything else. It spends more time on the nudie actress's website plotline than it does on even trying to explain why Allison decides to keep a baby by a total stranger. And that is why I think it deserves to be written off. So yeah, Katherine Heigl was right and Judd Apatow was wrong. And in conclusion, remember to have safe sex. Don't scream at bouncers in the middle of the street and... Go! Go fuck your fucking bong, you I fuck! I will fuck my bong, doggy style, for once. Hey guys, so I have been trying to get this video up for... For the longest time. Whoa! But Universal kept blocking it and I had to do a bunch of weird editing, so I apologize for the weird editing. And then I tried to get creative and make my Sims act out the scene so Universal could leave me the fuck alone. I worked really hard on this video and it has been a true nightmare trying to get this up finally, so I hope you enjoyed it.